Hi, this is Patty Corbett Ward, and I would like to welcome, to, welcome you to another edition of Learning Thursdays. As always, I just offer a brief overview of the initiative before we go into the presentation. And as you can read from the slide, these were developed as a way to offer professionals in our field a free learning opportunity with the goal of improving the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are required to master the competencies that you need when you work in the substance use disorder field. Because the goal when you walk in the door, my belief is to improve the lives of people who come to your program, be it treatment, prevention, or recovery. So we are going to meet three people today. You're going to meet Pat Zuber Wilson, who is an employee of Oasis as well. She is going to give you a background of how this particular training came to be. And then she's going to introduce you to Michael Martin and Peter Hill, who are our presenters and have come from, as you can see, NACS, the Native American Community Services of Erie and Niagara Counties. As always, if you have any questions, forward them to the Learning Thursdays mailbox noted on the slide in front of you, and somebody will get back to you in a timely manner. All that being said, I would like to hand it over to Pat Zuber Wilson, who again will talk to you for a short period of time and then turn it over to our presenters. So enjoy the presentation and I will be back at the end. Thank you. Hello, my name is Patricia Zuber Wilson and I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Federal Policy with the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, otherwise known as OASIS. Behavioral health and wellness for tribal communities begins with acknowledging the effects of historical trauma, honoring cultural values, and engaging in an exchange which leads to mutual understanding and comprehension on issues related to behavioral health services. Here in New York State, there are nine federally recognized Native American nations and over 560 federally recognized nations in the United States. The majority of Native Americans living in New York State do not reside on the territories. They live in rural areas as well as large urban centers. New York State has a population of over 19 million people with 1% identified as Native American and an estimated 110,000 living in New York City based on census data. New York is committed to improving access to health care services for the nations. OASIS partners with federal, state, and local agencies to help ensure comprehensive, culturally acceptable, affordable care is available to improve the lives of tribal populations. An integral part of communication between government and the nations is through the New York State Behavioral Health Tribal Consultation jointly held by OASIS and the State Office of Mental Health. OASIS and OMH hold two or more tribal consultations a year with the nations to foster effective collaboration and informed decision making with the ultimate goal of reaching consensus on issues. One of the main issues emphasized at the tribal consultation is the critical need to build cultural awareness of Native Americans among the substance abuse and mental health fields while at the same time emphasizing trust, respect, and shared responsibility. There is a general awareness that Native Americans experience higher rates of alcohol and substance use. However, the scope of these behavioral health problems is not fully understood and it is important to help improve cultural understanding of Native Americans and Alaska Native behavioral health needs. We felt it important to provide a Learning Thursday to specifically discuss cultural awareness of Native Americans and provide a better pathway to substance abuse services and overall wellness. 
I am pleased to introduce two experts who have a long history and wealth of knowledge in integrating cultural competence of Native Americans into behavioral health services. Michael is an Onondaga of the Beaver Clan from the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory in Southern Ontario, but was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. In February of 2004, Michael was named the Executive Director of Native American Community Services of Erie and Niagara Counties, also known as NACS. In 2016, he was named by his clan mother as a faith keeper for his Onondaga Beaver clan. Michael serves as a board member of several organizations, including a member of the New York State Behavioral Health Services Advisory Council. Over the years, Michael has been involved at various levels with other local and national Native American organizations or initiatives, including the Native American Leadership Commission on Health and AIDS, Native American Family Services Commission, Indian Defense League of America, Native American Alliance for Health and Well-Being, and represented NACS as just one of 12 organizations invited to meet at the White House with members of the Obama administration to discuss urban Indian affairs in 2010. Michael has presented nationally and throughout the state on issues impacting Native Americans. We truly appreciate Michael's efforts to help individuals understand the underlying causes of health and wellness of Native Americans and the intergenerational trauma and family dynamics that are unique to the Native American community. Michael's advocacy on behalf of the Native American community in Western New York has resulted in better access to services that will improve their pathway to health and healing. Because of his advocacy, New York is becoming more and more culturally aware of the unique needs of Native Americans, which is so critical to knowing what appropriate services to provide to aid in their healing and recovery. We also have Pete Hill with us, who is an enrolled member of the Cayuga Nation, Heron Clan, and currently the All Our Relations Project Director at Native American Community Services of Erie and Niagara Counties. Pete has worked with NACS for over 25 years, spending the majority of that time with several youth and community programs addressing alcohol, substance abuse prevention, suicide prevention, crisis intervention, teen pregnancy prevention, and HIV risk reduction. He has been involved in health and wellness promotion and has integrated many Native American cultural teachings and approaches into program design, evaluation, and strength-based approaches. Pete has also been heavily involved with the development of new approaches and initiatives to help the community move beyond the impact of historical traumas and related factors that have negatively impacted the intergenerational health and vitality of Native American people. Thank you, Michael and Pete, for presenting today on this important topic. Now I will turn it over to both of you. Thank you, Pat, for that kind and wonderful introduction. And welcome, and thank you for joining us today as we are happy to share information about working with Native Americans and substance abuse and understanding the importance of expanding trauma-informed care from individuals to communities. I'm Michael Martin, Executive Director at Native American Community Services, and with me is Pete Hill, our All Our Relations Project Director. And our training goal for today is to enhance you and your organization's ability to engage with Native Americans in more positive and respectful ways to achieve positive outcomes for our work. First, a little bit about our organization. Native American Community Services uh, is based in Buffalo with offices in Niagara Falls and Lockport in western New York, but also recently looking to expand beyond our historical boundaries. Founded in 1975, we've had 42 years in our tradition of caring and offer a holistic range of services uh, targeted towards our, our Native American populations in our service area, including family services, economic self-sufficiency, health and wellness, community and cultural services, and our All Our Relations Project, a special initiative funded by the uh, Kellogg Foundation. Uh, our focus is serving the off-nation territory population uh, that both uh, are within and, uh, and border New York State, as well as uh, all of 
all people, including the Native and non-Native American community alike. On our agenda for today, we'd like to talk about Native American culture, overviewing some of our uh, basic information to give you a grounding and perspective, as well as then exploring a social cultural model, uh, which is a use, useful framework to address health disparities. And then we'll uh, talk about historical trauma and related factors, and look at some of the approaches that uh, we've developed that you also might find useful in your thinking in, in terms of working with our population. And that's our HOPE approach and some other related efforts along those lines. And then any additional considerations and some final thoughts that we'll share with you. Um, first, before all else, we have to uh, start as we do traditionally with our Thanksgiving address, our gononio, or what we say is the words that become before all of us. It's, a, it's an address that humbles us and grounds us in a perspective of gratitude and abundance. And it puts us in a good frame of mind and is the basis of our what we call our ganaquio or ganagohio, our good mindedness. And um, it starts, of course, with the people, the fact that you arrive safely at your destination to be able to join us and watch this presentation. Because uh, certainly there's a lot of people that don't meet their destinations or maybe don't even make it home at night. So the fact that you arrived safely, we, we give thanks and honor that. We we'll also give thanks and recognize those that aren't with us, maybe friends, family, colleagues, those that uh, might be on our minds, but we, we set them aside uh, when we're together so that we can be present with each other in the moment that we have to share. Because in our thinking, we feel any time people gather, it's a sacred time, a special time, because all of our life's journeys have now crossed at this moment and might not ever repeat. So we want to honor and be present in those moments and uh, give respect for them. And we'll also give thanks and think of those that came before us, our ancestors, and those that are yet to come, our future generations. And uh, as our speakers would do, they'll, at, if after each first, bring our minds together as one and give thanks. And then we move on, and I was always taught to go from the ground up, so we'll give thanks to our mother, the earth. We give thanks to uh, the waters and all the fishes in the waters. And of course, water is life. We can't live on this planet without water. Um, and so we want to give thanks and honor that, and that it's there still, all of creation is still there doing the job that it was intended. And then we go on, we give thanks to the grasses and the plant life, those that not only add beauty, but balance into the ecosystem. Uh, we give thanks to the, the plant life that provides us our sustenance, like our three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, and those medicine plants that bring us back to balance and harmony. We give thanks to uh, the trees and all of the trees that, uh, and all the duties that they, they carry on. And again, one of those elements that we need to be uh, have life here on this planet. Uh, without trees taking the CO2 we breathe and turning it back into oxygen uh, that we can breathe, we can't live here. And yet, um, all far too often, we don't give them that respect that they need uh, to honor them and cherish them, and that they're still doing the job that was intended for them as well. And then we give thanks to the animal world, the two-legged, four-legged, and winged. We give thanks to uh, the four winds, that which brings change. We give thanks to our grandfathers, the thunders, uh, our eldest brother, the sun, our grandmother, moon, all the stars and celestial beings, our pathway back to what we, in our creation story, call the sky world. And we give thanks to what we call our enlightened teachers, our four spirit guides and protectors that help us on our way. And finally, we give thanks to Sanguin Tiso, our creator for all of creation, and all these gifts and things that were intended to keep us healthy and well. And finally, the speaker would say that, uh, uh, again, we bring our minds together as one. And if there is anything that was shared was not to be uh, offensive, but any, and, and if there's anything that uh, you're thankful for that hasn't been mentioned, that you also offer that thanks and gratitude at this time. We bundle our minds again together as one, and we give thanks. And our speakers, were, or in the traditional language, would say donato. And then that means we're done and we can carry on with our business that we have or our social events that we have. Uh, again, it's something that we do when we gather as people, but it's also something we're taught to do when we wake up and when we go to sleep at night to put us in a perspective, again, uh, and, and help ground us in that perspective of gratitude and abundance. Uh, we can see that we have a benevolent creator that intends us to be healthy and well, that has given us all these gifts of creation, the things we need to live here on earth and be healthy and well. And if it wasn't for we might not have all of the things that uh, we want, uh, like the fanciest car or the newest shoes or the biggest screen TV or things like that, but we have the things we need to be healthy and well. And in that, uh, it's supposed to uh, help us to 
uh, have a better frame of mind about things. And certainly if you were to even tonight to give thanks for all the wonderful things that you had in your life, the fact that you got up, uh, have another day of life on this earth, what a present that is, or that you had a, um, a roof over your head, uh, and if it uh, clothes on your body and blankets to keep you warm, you had food available for you to eat, you had people who had care and concern uh, for you and your safety and well-being. Uh, far too often across many communities, uh, there are people who don't have some of those very basics of life, so you can give thanks that you do. But it might be uh, kissing your spouse off in the morning or your child before they go on the school bus. Um, you could be hearing a song that reminds you of somebody who was important, uh, who, who meant a lot to you, was a good teacher, someone you loved, who might not be near whether they moved far away or maybe have passed on. Uh, and so really when you go through your whole day, you have a lot to be thankful for. And uh, that perspective is supposed to feed what we call our, our good mind. And it's a, a pathway to health and well-being. Gratitude is a pathway to happiness. Um, uh, abundance is a pathway to peace because if I realize we have all that we need to be healthy and well, then I don't have to fight you for over anything. And if we work together, we can actually have more. And then appreciation is a pathway to both respect and honor. And in this thinking, it's the foundation of what we call the good mind. And it's a perspective that is not only supposed to be something to aspire to, but it's supposed to affect our, our attitudes, our thoughts, our actions and behaviors. It's a way of life, a way of being. And it's a way we're supposed to carry ourselves and have it impact how we, we live our daily lives and find balance and harmony within ourselves. And it's part of a bundle of teachings in our Haudenosaunee perspectives or people of the Longhouse that feed our health and well-being and are supposed to feed our health and well-being every day. And we go on, we talk about other teachings that are part of that, that includes our, uh, our great law of peace. Our Haudenosaunee Confederacy was founded when a peacemaker brought to us the messages of peace, power, and righteousness, unifying the original five nations of our Confederacy. And in that, those five nations were taught that peace, uh, we should always uh, seek peace, and that's a struggle for balance and harmony both within ourselves, with each other, and with all of creation. And uh, that idea of power isn't power like control over another, it's the power of the collective, the power in unity, the power of coming together. And the way the peacemaker demonstrated to us that to us was that he took an arrow and gave it to the strongest warrior in each village. And of course, that warrior was able to break it with some effort. And then he bundled five arrows together, which signified the original five nations of our confederacy, gave it to that same warrior, and he couldn't break it. And that simple act just demonstrated that when bounded together with good minds, we're much stronger together than we are apart. And then finally, that, that third element within the great law of righteousness is that good-mindedness, seeing the best of intentions with each other, working through uh, without conflict, having good discussions and working collaboratively together uh, to find good results and keeping that positive frame of mind uh, to both uh, ensure our mental well-being but our physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being as well. And when he brought these five nations together on this Hiawatha belt, it unified the original five nations of our confederacy. The keepers of the eastern door, the Mohawks, all to the Oneidas, and the keepers of the central fire, the Onondagas, which around present-day Syracuse, just south of present-day Syracuse, and then the Cayugas in the Finger Lakes region, and then finally the keepers of the western door, the Senecas in western New York. And you can see that both doorways are open, that anyone can come into and have business within the Confederacy and can also uh, learn and accept and live by these principles under the great law and become part of the Confederacy. The only other nation to do so to this point has been the Tuscarora Nation that came back in the 1700s to join the Confederacy under these principles. And uh, a concept that we have with um, uh, relations with uh, non-natives is what we call the Covenant Chain series of wampum belts, which includes the Gaswenta or the two-row wampum belt. And all, and all of the um, Covenant Chain series, it's uh, uh, people that came into our territory, first the Dutch, the French, the British, Americans, Canadians, uh, all that came in said, we want to be like a father to you and take care of you. And we said, no, our ancestors recognized them as fellow human beings. Although they dress different, look different, talk different, maybe eat different foods, they recognized them as fellow human beings. So they said, you couldn't be our father, but we can be brothers and sisters with each other. And that's the way we are going to be. As long as the grass grows, the sun shines, and the waters flow, 
And in that thinking, this two-row wampum belt was uh, uh, signified as a, a journey of our two vessels together, that we are bounded by those uh, three principles in that covenant chain that says there's three chains are peace or friendship and good minds. And those three chains that uh, uh, link our ships together, but we would never uh, cross into each other's vessel. So the two purple rows that you see is one, us in our canoe, and, and the other being their vessel, their ship, whoever it may be that we were working with at the time, um, both traveling in parallel down this uh, river of life together, facing common dangers, enjoying common bounty, mutual aid and respect, but that we would never cross into each other's vessel to steer it. And this plays an important role even to this day in terms of our elders teaching us this. This is why sometimes the census numbers are underrepresented because um, there's concern that we're crossing this true row uh, by filling out the census because it's another government that's coming in to get that information. Um, in other cases, in terms of uh, voting rights and things like that, where we don't have uh, representation because uh, we can't vote because, and we're taught many of us not to vote because we're crossing that two row and picking the captain of the other ship, therefore steering its vessel. Uh, and I can certainly understand sometimes the census information on the nation territories uh, because it is a nation to nation relationship. In the urban areas, if we give that information, it's like saying there's a rock coming up. They still have to decide whether to steer left, steer right, or run into it. That's still their choice, what they do with that information. So therefore, we're not steering the ship. So it's still uh, an alive belt today that is in interpreted and used um, to help us go forward, but also uh, limits somewhat our, our ability to be fully represented in, in, in different matters uh, where those issues come into play. But we have our representation through our traditional governments as well across all of our territories. And so uh, within that thinking, we have all this beauty in our traditional concepts and in our, in our longer versions of cultural competency. We'd spend a whole day going through in greater depth these concepts and the good mind and all of those teachings that are intended to keep us healthy and well. And typically after the end of that first day, You'll hear people that will ask, well, with such a beauty and power perspective in your teachings, then why are Native Americans some of the dis most disproportionate? And it's because we have to look at the intergenerational issues that are there as well. And we're taught to think generationally looking seven generations ahead, that every action and decision we make, we have to ensure the well-being seven generations down the road. And just as we can look back seven generations before us and give thanks to all the sacrifices and the teachings and the gifts that were left for us by our ancestors. And certainly we are the life and breath of our ancestors. They live through us, through our DNA, with every beat of our hearts, with every breath we take. And many of the thoughts that we have are embedded through us, through our ancestors. And so when we look back at seven generations, it's hard for people to think to their parents, grandparents, all the way down to their great, 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 great grandparents. And um, it's also difficult for them to think forward to through their children and grandchildren, great grandchildren, all the way down to their great, 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 great grandchildren. And um, so we often talk about looking at a microcosm of yourself as one generation and then looking back. Uh, three generations to your parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents if you're lucky so enough to have met them and got to know them or at least hear the stories from them. And not only give thanks for all the teachings and gifts that were passed on through the generations, but also understand some of the issues that might be there too that have taken us from who we are to some of the issues that we see in our communities and in our individuals and our families today. And, let, and at the same time, look forward three generations completing the seven to your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and what is the legacy you want to leave with them. And so to talk more about th some of those uh, health and social disparities, I'm going to turn it over to Pete to share that information with you as well. Well, thank you, Michael, and thank you all of you for joining us on today's webinar through the learning series, and thank you for OASIS for allowing us to present uh, some of our training content through the, our, our All Our Relations Project at Native American Community Services. When Michael was talking about a lot of the traditional teachings, there are many paths and ways to have a good life, to have a good under understanding, respect for ourselves and each other in, in a ways of having peace in the things that he was speaking of. But at the same time, it's really important that we recognize that many Native communities are experiencing some severe health and social disparities, and it's imp important to recognize that. 
some of the data that we found is that even though this is data is relative a few years old, we recognize a lot of the data is similar. We, as Native people nationally, we have the rate, uh, highest rates of having a poor health status among all racial and ethnic groups. We are more likely to be poor, to be active smokers, to have uh, heart disease or uh, diabetes, to have a functional limitation due to a chronic condition, or have the health lowest rates of being at a healthy rate among our peoples. Native people also have the highest rates of binge drinking, alcohol abuse, heavy alcohol abuse, and, and suicide rates among certain age populations. And then we also have the lowest high school graduation rates of all people in the United States. So when we look at that, we also recognize those are national data, but in 2012, NACS released a community profile needs assessment, and we found that issues of hypertension, stroke, asthma, emphysema, weight problems, hearing problems, diabetes, and alcohol abuse are even at worse rates in the local community in Erie and Niagara counties than they are nationally. So these are really important issues that we recognize but if we take care of that even further, this is a list of about 25 different health and social conditions and problems that we see in our community. And Native people aren't doing too well on any of these issues. We have the highest rates of, of or next to the highest rates of all these things, and it's gotten to be so bad where I've heard a lot of our elders and other scholars talking about that our life expectancy is about 55 years old. We don't live generally until the 70s and 80s that other populations do, but we see all this, the combination of all these health issues and we can understand why our life expectancy is many times so short. But one of the things that we recognize as, as well is that in terms of providing services, that many of our services are very segmented and siloed. If we take a look at this list and we start with alcohol abuse, we can trace a pattern from alcohol abuse. A lot of the people who I know in the Native community who are alcoholics were beer drinkers. And we recognize that alcohol turns into carbohydrates and to sugar which uh, directly relates to obesity, which is a major problem in, the, in native communities. From obesity and given alcohol abuse, we can recognize the connections with diabetes, which is another health issue in many native communities. And then heart disease, with all those three, three, all those three factors combined to generate a lot of health disease issues. We can probably trace arrows from all, a lot of these different health issues. And it's really important to recognize that from the community's perspective, Many of these issues are connected, and if they're dealing with one or two issues, they're probably dealing with a lot more. But on the service provision side, one of the issues and problems that we've seen is that many of these are segmented in silos, or are, are developed in silos. So it's not as engaging or effective to engage Native communities members who are dealing with a lot of these health issues as well. We recognize the impact of the development of trauma-informed care. And we really appreciate that because it's understanding, you know, as we know, what's not what's wrong with this person, what's wrong with you, but more what's happened to you. And we recognize as well the adverse childhood experiences through the th CDC studies, how people are treated as children, how that impacts their adult life and their health conditions, which contributes to early death that we know very well. We've seen a lot in our community as well. But in terms of trauma-informed care, the one thing that we believe is missing is the awareness of intergenerational patterns and consequences that were affected by historical traumas. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. Historical trauma is a relatively new concept in public health, but the idea is that populations that were historically subjected to long-term mass trauma, such as colonialism, slavery, war, genocide, and other factors, exhibit a higher prevalence of disease even after several generations of the original trauma have passed. It's important to recognize this because if we understand how historical trauma impacts entire communities, it may lead to, pipe, to pathways to promote uh, more effective ways of eliminating these health disparities and engaging members of the community who are suffering from these health disparities. At NACS, we've developed uh, in our all relations project and throughout our organization, we use what's called the sociocultural model of HIV prevention. It was developed in about 2000, in 1999 by the New York State HIV Prevention Planning Group. And even though it's focused on HIV prevention and originally developed for HIV prevention, we've used it for issues of alcohol abuse, substance abuse, uh, suicide prevention, HIV risk reduction, fa uh, family violence, and a host of other issues. We think that it's a really important, helpful model. The idea behind this sociocultural model is that before any community or any program can be effective within a given community, we need to understand at least three things about this community. First thing is historical underpinnings. These are things that have happened in the past that still have an impact in the community today. 
Uh, some of the things I'll be, some of the examples I'm going to be sharing about historical pun underpinnings go many centuries back. External factors is another consideration that we need to recognize. These are things that have developed and impacted community, but the community members never invented and never, never developed those ideas themselves, but still have a major impact of how other people think of, our, of a given community. And the third thing is to recognize the community's cultural norms. Every community has the ways of community members talking to each other. There's language, gestures, mannerisms that people do within a given community. There's things, the ways that people communicate, and there's ways that people don't communicate within every given community. And if we're trying to engage members of a community, we may not be effective unless we look at these three factors, especially their cultural norms, which is Michael gave the grounding on the traditionally and ancestrally traditional teachings. But we also need to recognize every community has those cultural norms, every community has external factors and historical underpinnings. But what's really critical to, about using this model is that we need to recognize that members of that given community need to be in the discussion about interpreting these ideas, what it means for them. I may be a good friend of a um, member, a good friend of another community, but if not part of that community, it would be inappropriate for me to explain these things, these things with another community. We need to have members of the community understanding these ideas and what it talks about. So we talk about historical under, underpinnings, recognizing the impact of, on native populations and indigenous populations. In our trainings, we show this video that I'm showing the screen here. We're not going to show it today, but it's called The Doctrine of Discovery. What it talks about and what it traces in this hour-long documentary is it goes back to the year 1452, where the Roman Catholic Pope issued papal bulls or papal doctrines that said that the sm a small group of European Catholic Christian people are real human beings. Everybody else throughout the world is less than being human, either a subhuman, an infidel, a Saracen, a pagan, and they even talk about how p other populations throughout the world are, could be considered an enemy of Christ. They've used these, these ideas of these papal bulls that date back into the 1400s to justify a lot of the atrocities, a lot of the genocide, against indigenous people throughout the world. It helped, genify, or it helped justify the slave trade in their mind in Africa, and it certainly had justified in their minds the taking of a lot of lands in the, among native people, a lot of the violence, a lot of the loss of life that native people have suffered throughout the history. But what's also important to recognize about this doctrine of discovery is that modern day Supreme Court decisions as recently as 2015 have referenced ideas from the doctrine of discovery thinking that a certain group of people are superior than other people, especially with indigenous people, and it's okay for them to take the lands and to do other things, the atrocities, following this doctrine of discovery. This is a very powerful documentary that I would uh, uh, suggest that people take a look at when they have the time to do so. The other factor that we recognize in historical trauma is the introduction of alcohol to native people and native populations. In Europe, there was this knowledge and experience of knowing how alcohol how strong a drink it can be, but what when Europeans came over here and then tried to negotiate treaties, we know that many times people, native people were given the alcohol before a treaty making session was going to happen. Basically getting the native people drunk and without having that knowledge of knowing how strong alcohol can be, they would take the alcohol and then many of us know how people change the first time they get under the influence. So for native people, it had damaging effects and we lost a lot of concessions. And there's some documentation I've heard of, even in my own nation, where the Cuban nation, we lost our land, uh, ancestral land base in the 19, in 1790s. There's some documentation that shows that our Cuga ancestors, my Cuga ancestors, were giving alcohol as part of this main, main uh, idea of the treaty, treaty uh, process and negotiating these treaties. Unfortunately, alcohol has remained in our communities for a lot of different factors, but we also recognize our population size. Before 1492, I've heard several professors and researchers, native and non-native, who have stated that there are at least 50 million native people living in what is now the United States. A tremendous diversity of native people throughout the country, what is now the country, and really a tremendous respect for all the different people because all the native people have their own creation stories thinking that the creator placed us here. But going from 50 million or more native people you can see this map, this is in the uh, mid early 1800s, I believe, and the map of what it is today, you can see where our land bases are. So going from 50 million people or more 
before 1492, in the early 1900s, our population was down to about 300,000. A lot of Native people have died along the way, either through disease and other things that we'll be talking about, and we're showing uh, some of the documentaries that we're, we'll be showing sh shortly. So our, our land base, even here in New York State, rather than being throughout the state, we, this is a map from Syracuse University that shows our nation territories, and our land bases are so small many times that you can see, we've also had to add arrows to show where the directions are or where the land bases are. You can see the different nations, the Seneca Nation, the Cayuga Nation, Oneidas, Onondaga, and the different Mohawk communities. So a lot of the, our communities are separated from each other, we're segmented, a whole idea of divide and conquer strategy has been impacted on Native communities and we can see the result of this based on our where we are now. So going forward, another issue that we recognize the impact is the impact of historical trauma as residential boarding schools. And at this point, I'd like to turn it back to Michael to talk about the documentary that we're going to show in just a few moments. Yeah, Unseen Tears was a documentary we produced in 2009 that looked at and explored the intergenerational issues related to historical trauma uh, born out of the boarding or residential school experience. Uh, it was something that it, we had just started to explore ourselves in our own community and really we're at the tip of the iceberg of understanding the true ramifications of these intergenerational experiences upon our people. And um, it was produced through the Community Foundation for Greater Buffalo program called Channel 09. They looked at stories of the Niagara frontier and brought together uh, organizations like us and local documentary filmmakers and we were uh, thankful to be partnered with at, at that time a UB graduate student uh, named Ron Douglas uh, who helped uh, very sensitively uh, produce this uh, what, which was supposed to be a 15 minute documentary we showed him an 18 minute rough cut and it's uh, just under a half hour uh, long piece that explores these issues and um, I don't want to share too much about it in terms of uh, I'd rather you experience it as you watch it for the first time but I would like to caution those that might be triggered by some of the issues. It's a very powerful uh, piece with uh, uh, powerful content and stories shared of different abuses that these uh, uh, survivors had uh, endured through these experiences. So we wanted to share some cautions with you and before you watch it that uh, uh, if you might be sensitive to those triggers that uh, you take extra precautions as you get to those sections. Uh, in our native community we often have water next to us uh, to help. It's a cleansing um, uh, a process to take a drink of water when we feel our, our throats tightened or those tears about to fall uh, to help cleanse us and strengthen us. Uh, so I encourage you to, to enjoy some water with this because uh, it will help you uh, deal with some of the content. At the same time though, I think it's uh, important that these stories get told and shared uh, to build a deeper understanding of the uh, multitude of effects uh, these experiences had on our people. Uh, we'll share a little bit of debriefing at the end um, and certainly if you uh, are by yourself and and have some of those cautions uh, you can certainly watch it another time when you have some supports that are along with you but uh, I do thank you for taking the time to view it and uh, we'll have some commentary at the end to debrief it when we get back.
Blackfoot Indians. That's a song that was counting dead Indians uh, back on the trails when they would kill Indians. See all these little kids in uniform, and we'd be wondering how come they're like that. We weren't dressed like that, but these little kids were. I remember being younger, growing up on the reservation, and being told, don't trust white people, don't listen to them. Never told why. The government schools are constantly being built and hospitals added. We bring them in, clean them up, and start them on their way to civilization. I would ask social services and human services audience, how many people know about residential boarding schools? How many people here do? This never makes it into the history books. This is never talked about. Why did those schools get started, and who started them, and what was the rationale behind it? And the first general policy was the only good Indian was a dead Indian, that we needed to be killed, exterminated, eradicated. Um, once they realized that's a little bit more difficult to do is to have mass genocide of a population, uh, the policies changed to, from killing to killing the Indian and saving the man. There's a General Pratt who was well famous and documented for using those words to kill the Indian and save the man and that we are subhuman and that our ways are savage and we need to be civilized. Well, in the governments in Canada and the United States, which became governments of Canada and the United States, uh, followed that policy up until the, the 1980s in one form or another. There is a boarding school far, far away where we get mush and milk for three times a day. Oh, how the huskies run when they hear their dinner bell. Oh, how the huskies run three times a day. Like I say, I went to the mush hall when I was four years old. I was there for nine years. And uh, once in a while, we'd come home in on, summertime, but not all the time. When the counselors came and told my dad that he couldn't raise us properly, we were at the mush hole one week and our heads were full of bugs. Well, there was a lot of sad times, but I mean, like, I didn't get, like, angry and have any resentment until after I got out. Because I didn't know, like, uh, from just from five and a half to 16, they just thought it was just like a normal upbringing. Like, they not have no parents and stuff like that. Right. So that's the... Uh, and after I got out, and then they thought, well, this is the way they were supposed to be uh, treating us. I think my mother couldn't take care of us because uh, our father was uh, into alcohol. Me and my sister, we started there in 1945. I was five years old at the time. We had all our hair cut off. We were made baldies. We were really bald. And uh, that wasn't a very good feeling to have. And uh, they used to call us uh, mush hole baldies. That's what they used to, the kids on a reserve used to call us. Well, we can go in now. I mean, this is going to take like all day, eh? <laughs> Dude. We were taken to the hospital to get checked out for uh, nits and whatever, I guess that was, and, you know. Uh, well, they checked us out, you know. Then, yeah. then, then they split us. The, the school was split in age group and by the boys and girls. Boys were on one side, the girls were on one side. And they went from the lower age up to uh, high school level. My mom was going to walk out here and go out this door. And, uh, and at five and a half, I, uh, my sister tells me that I grabbed my mom's leg. And uh, you know, of course, we were all just crying. We were, the whole four of us were just crying. Like, you know, because uh, my mom was going to leave us here. So I, I grabbed my mom's leg and, uh, well, crying and that. and. Uh, uh, just kind of like uh, hollering, like, Ma, don't leave me, like, don't leave me, like, you know. So, but anyway, like, uh, while that was going on, like, the supervisor came over and just kind of grabbed me and took me off my Ma's leg, and, uh, and then my Ma just walked out, and I never seen her uh, for those ten, ten years that I was here. She never come to see me once. I don't know why. He took my brother away to where he was supposed to stay, and my sister, she just went on her own. 
I was with most of the four, year, four and five year olds. We didn't go to school because we were too young. Yet, through the agencies of the government, they are being rapidly brought from their state of comparative savagery and barbarism to one of civilization. When we used our language, we, at that young age too, you know, we were just learning. So uh, they used to wash our mouth out with soap. They would take the whole bunch of us and march us to the uh, shower, coal shower, and they'd throw us in there and beat us along the way. And that was a routine thing, I guess, I don't know. But that, uh, t that taught us, you know. They'd throw us in this dark press room where they kept all our Sunday go-to-meeting clothes, and uh, they'd throw Rosemary and I in there and uh, tell us the rats were going to get us. But uh, I didn't know then why I was being thrown in there, and I used to wonder, what did I do? And uh, I would cry, and Rosemary would cry, and we cried and cried for hours in there, not knowing why we were in there. And uh, they'd take us out. And when I did get to learn a little bit of English, I knew then they were throwing us in there because we wouldn't speak English. And uh, I must have been stubborn right from the day I was born because I thought to myself, I'll never speak English either. You want me to speak English? I won't speak English. So I didn't speak at all for two whole years because I figured if I spoke Indian, I could lick him. And uh, if I spoke English, then it would be against everything that I stood for. And so I didn't speak at all. But today, they all speak English and some have taken business courses, home economics, and other higher training. Took us into another room down there, and maybe down in the playroom. We took all our clothes off, and we put the, uh, the clothes of the school on. Yeah, and they give us a number. So my number was like 48, and my brother was uh, 36. My family was the state-run institute, and the nickname for the Thomas Indian School is Salem. And Salem was derived from asylum, and you know what an asylum is, it's for crazy people. So we were thought of as being crazy, I guess. They were just considered bad people, bad children, but they weren't bad children, okay? They were placed there for, for so many different reasons, but not because of any kind of delinquency um, on their part. But that is not how they were treated. We went from, from uh, washing up in the morning, and they marched us to the chow hall where we ate. Everything was routine, just like the military. One of the superintendents during the time that my mother was there actually came from uh, correctional services. And so because that person came with that kind of a um, uh, a background in corrections and working in penitentiaries, that's exactly how he decided that Thomas Indian School would be operated. Children marched from here to there, um, just everything, you know, had its place. I talked to some of the, the men who went there. I would say a majority of them went into the military. Military life was easy for them. They knew how to do all the marching, they knew how to line up, they knew how to dress with their uniforms, everything being exact, making the bed in a military style. They knew all that before they went into the military. I was in A Division, my sister was in B Division. A whole lot of things that happened. Things that I can remember. When I was six years old, this man chased uh, Rosemary and I from Mohawk Park because they took us all on an outing when it was time to come home. This man called us into the gazebo, told Rosemary and I that he had something for us. and. That's where he tried to molest us, and we ran. And even now, I, I have nightmares of uh, running. But my brother, he ran away after being here about five years. They never caught him, so. He said that we were really bad and we were born of the devil. And if we told anybody what he was doing, they wouldn't believe us anyway. And that's so true. 
because when he did, I think, uh, I think he had penetrated me that time. And uh, I was bleeding and I was sore. And I went and I told the nurse. And she asked me what happened, so I told her. And she gave me a strapping, a real good strapping. And she told me, don't you ever speak about him like that again. She said, he would never do anything like that to you. So there I was again, getting another licking. And uh, like now when I think about all the things that happened, I said, you're damned if you did and damned if you didn't, no matter which way you got a licking. And it, it just wasn't, just, it just wasn't right. And I remember this person telling me that any of the boys in his particular dormitory floor who were not circumcised yet at that point, without being told, were marched over to the infirmary. And if they weren't circumcised by then, they were circumcised. And if they didn't have their tonsils out by then, they, they had their tonsils removed. And I just couldn't imagine uh, from his story uh, how this could take place, number one. Um, and number two, back in those times, on the late 40s and early 50s, they didn't have air conditioning like we had. And just the whole trauma of, of that personal invasion. We were always having a physical. And then, like I said, if you had a hangnail, you had to go see the doctor. And if you got caught sitting on the ground or holding hands with the boy, you had to go see the doctor. Um, they were all the time checking to make sure that everybody was a virgin. So in the summertime when we went out to work, he would give us a physical. And then when he came back, we'd get the physical. I said, and you better come back with everything that you left. You know, you should, he wanted to know if you had intercourse or not, you know. And, um, but everything, little thing, the uh, sexual, they were always checking on us, you know. Yeah, they had you scared, but one girl thought, one girl thought that you got pregnant just holding hands. They had shop on, the, on this floor here, then uh, home economics on the t uh, above. And, uh, see. Yeah, so I had my tonsils out, and I can remember trying to fool them. They used to put us to sleep with the ether. So they put a mask over us and we'd be tied down and they'd pour that ether over our nose right like this and wait a while. And you'd have to inhale that, you know? And then they'd put some more on there again until you actually fell asleep from the ether. And um, then they'd take your tonsils out. And there's the hospital over there. You want to get up closer? It's... Yeah. I, I spent a year in that building, the hospital. And then we always laughed about, there was a head in there, he had in a bottle. <laughs> We'd show everybody that got admitted to the hospital. You want to see the head in there? It was, it was in a jar, he'd saved. Uh, appendix two were saved. He had them in a little bottle. So you want your appendix back? <laughs> you know, they dead to save those. Just kept getting one thing right after the other. I had infection in my ear. Then I had whooping cough, mumps, measles. You name it, I had it. And uh, I had no help with my schoolwork. I ended up failing. My brother uh, was in uh, sick there, and they said he just had a cough and a cold. And uh, they would never let my father go up to see him. So one day my father came and he told the nurse he was going up to see his son and there was nothing she could do to stop him. And she said that she would call the principal. And he told her, call the principal. He pushed her out of the way and he went up. He says when he got up there, the stench was so bad he couldn't even hardly breathe. And uh, he went in and there was my brother. The principal came running up after him, telling him to leave. And he told the principal, he said, if you don't want to go down those stairs, he said, you better leave. He says, and you better call the ambulance. So they called an ambulance and the ambulance came. My brother was in Branford General Hospital for six months. He had pleurisy and uh, he was there for six months. Then he was transferred to Lady Wellington Hospital in Oshwegan for three more months. When he came out of the hospital, he was so weak he couldn't even hold a pencil. And uh, he just never ever really got better. 
he died an alcoholic. What we see and the people we work with, there is multi-generational alcoholism in a lot of the families that we've worked with. And we do the genealogy charts usually with the family to find out who their family is and what their resources might they might have. And we do find that some of the uh, parents or grandparents that they had were in boarding schools. I would like to share with you my part of my childhood and the effects boarding school has had on me. Um, my father attended the Thomas Indian School. My grandfather went to Carlisle. My mother and father were both in a boarding school and my uh, father was married before he married my mother. So he had two children and they were sent away to a uh, boarding school. So uh, I might say two generations there were in boarding school. My mother was went to Thomas Indian School and uh, my uh, father was at Carlisle, which was in uh, Pennsylvania. We all found the one that men sit together. I just want to grab a picture of my love. She had an Indian name, and the name that she had was to be a faith keeper's name. When she came out of that school, she couldn't speak a lick of Seneca. You can see the difficulty in um, when the families try to parent their children, that uh, the lack of bonding with their children, um, some anger, you know, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of anger and alcoholism. So those are some things that I see on a regular basis from families that uh, had a relative or parent or grandparent who were in boarding schools. I was ready for bed. Mom made Daddy get me up. I thought I was already ready for school. Okay? Got me up and cut all my hair up to a bump right below my ear. She cut about that much. That was the last time I was allowed long hair. That's abuse. And that was standard practice at the morning school. Yeah, everybody went through that one. Everyone, you see? But that was another thing. We don't know carryover. If that was a carryover, we don't know. She was trained to be a domestic. She learned the art of physical punishment. With the harsh punishment, you have a lot of domestic violence. Um, when, when a child is constantly defending themselves from the rest of the world, they cannot grow emotionally because they're always defending themselves against whatever is coming at them. So those are the things that we never get away from, you know. I, I am indigenous. I am proud of who I am. I'm on own way, and I'm proud of that. But I was not going to take any more abuse, you know. I think I took enough of it, you know, throughout my life. In second grade, Mrs. Cooley had us do a play, and we all had a great time with that play. And the play she chose was Little Black Sambo. And none of us really had been exposed to black people before, you know, so we didn't know any difference, you know. So we put on the Little Black, black Sambo uh, play, and uh, when she picked the cast, um, she picked uh, she told us this too. She picked the person in the room uh, that was of the darkest skin to play Sambo. And, um, and we all had our part. So it's, it was a very, I guess, subtle way to, to begin that whole teaching about, about um, racism, you know, and who is and who isn't, and the way we feel about people that are different than ourselves. So. And it, it, it kind of got, you know, built in at a, at a really young age. One, this one little boy used to, used, to cut, used to sing that song, one little, two little, three little Indians, but he used to put one little, two little, three little dirty Indians, and 
you know, this was a classmate. I was only in kindergarten. When I began to search out why I did the things that I did, that I began begin to understand what my father went through. I can remember my mother kind of ran our household like an institution. We had our daily chores, weekly chores posted to the refrigerator each week. We had to make our beds like in, in military style. That's exactly how she taught us. Everything was just prim and proper to the ironing, all of that. But it was almost in the same structure that she learned and she adopted in the only way that she knew how as a resident of a boarding school. Have we passed some of that on to our children? Yes, I think so. Is there going to be a point in time where our children's children will, will begin to move away from some of that? I, I think so, because I think in part of the healing um, that our families and our communities are going through and actually looking at um, some of this impact and being able to talk about it in a good and healthy way and to understand and to reflect not in a negative way helps us just to move beyond that and to try and get back a lot that we lost. So I'm just here today to look for that healing. I'm not looking for anything else. And I am looking to forgive. I forgave my mother, but I wanna, I wanna forget Thomas Indian School because I know in my heart that my mother did the best she could by me. You know, she wasn't to blame. She had an institution that was her parent. Kids were taken from here and sent to boarding schools like that. I mean, they would take young children, I'd say five, six years old, and send them. That's hard on a child. That's they change their way of life, you'd say, by doing that. They were used to living here, I mean. Everybody knows that, and everybody that really lived here, I don't think they could move from here. Nobody said anything. But I come down here so I can talk about my father because I'm proud of him. I'm proud of the life that he led and that he did the best he could with me and my, my sister and my brother. How long will it take us to really get back the whole idea of what a family is? What, what um, you know, father, mother, son, daughter, what, what does that bond mean? And not only just that, but even extending out to your extended family. Because these children, even if they didn't have parents if they were truly orphaned or if they had parents who truly couldn't take care of them, what happened to the extended family? That was also cut. Uh, you know, that's the point of it. We were only native people. So, you know, yeah, so they let that stuff go. So it would take a long time to undo And I can't say that it would ever happen because to heal, the apology from the government that allowed this to happen, I would say would never apologize. And who what, what, uh, what good would a hollow apology be? That's how I look at it. For an apology would have to be sincere. And how could it be sincere if it came from a guy that never went through that experience? or was the one behind it. It was before their time that it started. So how could they be apologi apologetic towards what they did to us? Oh, when it comes time to learn English or math, we got all kind of money being given to us for that. All kind of classrooms. But to let our people heal, they don't. There's nothing. And hearing 
what he suffered through it was a tough pill to swallow. I mean, he was a five-year-old boy, a little boy. Imagine your five-year-old being taken away from you. Or you at five years old being taken away from your mother. I mean, how would you feel? I couldn't imagine being taken away from my mom and dad at five years old. I would have never let it happen. I would have fought. Welcome back. I have to say that even though I've seen that video hundreds of maybe not thousands of times at this point, um, I've tried to develop a coping mechanism of leaving the room while it's being shown because uh, it still affects me and I think many of our people that watch it uh, even multiple times. And I think the part that gets me is still at the end. Um, there's two parts really. The first being that, that uh, thing we say where we uh, dedicate it to those that survived and those that didn't survive um, because we and we call them survivors not alumni or graduates from these schools and institutions but they are survivors but those that didn't survive I think of all the people we've lost through this process uh, there was a early report in uh, early 1900s in Canada that some of the schools had morbidity rates of 50 percent so half of our native children that entered this school never left it. And even recently as last summer, I think we were finding still unmarked graves at some of these schools and sites, including the Mush Hole, uh, where many of our people in Western New York had come from that uh, school in Southern Ontario. And we looked at the Thomas Indian School uh, in the Cattaraugus Territory in Western New York. But we also touched on the Carlisle School, which is in West, eastern Pennsylvania, which is probably the most infamous of these schools in this model. And certainly, the loss of our ancestors was one, those that had gone to these schools and never made it home again. But in reality, I think those that entered these schools, even if they lived and survived them, still never made it home again, because we lost the idea of what family is and what love is. And we know, I think all of us can understand, we become, when we become parents, we learn to parent how we're parented. And these individuals really got parented by these institutions with all these forms of harsh punishment and abuse that they endured. And so as they came out and had kids, often sometimes together, of two parents that had gone through these experiences, 
Now they're doing those abuses on to their children and their future generations. And we know in human services that somebody who's abused, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, or even sexual abuse, as you've seen in this video, those individuals are likely to grow up and perpetrate that abuse onto others or have very severe negative coping mechanisms, such as alcoholism and drug abuse, to hide the pain, the shame, the fear, the guilt that they still may be facing. And so they self-medicate themselves to deal with some of those issues, not always knowing as we look at these issues being passed intergenerationally, like you heard the one young man, Ryan, in the first opening scenes talk about he was always told not to trust white people. Well, that was something that was passed on to him with him not really knowing the origins of where that came to be. And that trust comes from these uh, institutions in large part and, and many other traumas that have been placed upon our people. But those things get passed on without really knowing their origin and uh, therefore they can't really deal with some of the issues. And as you heard earlier, earlier we talked about the, the positive attributes within our traditional teachings and uh, we've moved from that because this era also cut our ties to our traditional teachings. It, it removed pride from our people. Um, it, it said we were bad and our ways were, as you heard, the ways of the devil and we were uh, uh, not supposed to practice those things. We lost our languages uh, in this process. So all those traditional teachings that were intended to keep us healthy and well got cut from who, us, who we were. And so through these processes, all those health disparities that we experience today is not who we are. It's what we became through these intergenerational experience with historical trauma and other th issues that we've uh, come across. And certainly we've, we've lost people like the two uh, women that were in this video who, who courageously shared their story, Sally General and Noreen Johnson Shango, uh, they were also lost to us before we were able to debut the video. And those stories that they shared were so pivotal and critical that many of our families don't get to hear those stories being passed on and shared, so they can't make positive change or build understanding. And we know that there are issues within uh, where, where love comes out, but sometimes it's a, a perverted love. Uh, there was a story, uh, some of the video footage we got was from a 2009 Journey for Forgiveness that a good friend of ours white, at White Bison, Don Coyas, had led across different boarding school sites throughout the U.S. and I think into Canada where he collected these stories and shared and helped those communities to heal from these issues. And in one of these stories, there was a grandmother there that uh, by all accounts with her children and grandchildren also there that was um, very vile and vicious and angry and abusive to them. And even for her grandchildren uh, who knew she knew some of their native language, but when they asked her about it, she would actually physically get mad at them and angry and not teach them and they could never understand her. And so they kind of wrote her off and uh, had a lot of anger and resentment against her. But at this journey for forgiveness, um, hearing other survivors share their stories, she was finally able to get the courage to share hers. And in part, she was a grandmother with only two fingers. And I don't know if her children or grandchildren ever asked or she just never told the story. But in this moment, she rose and she was able to share that story of how she got two fingers. And as simple as it is, it's really quite tragic. In that story, she shared that when she spoke her language at one of the, the schools she was at, they actually cut off her pinky for her refusal to, do, to, to not to speak it. And then she spoke it a second time, they took the second finger. She spoke it a third time, they took that third digit, and that was the last time she ever spoke her language publicly again. So in the instance of her sharing that story, all that anger and resentment that her children and grandchildren held against her completely starts to change because in the perverted way, she was loving them and, and by not teaching them the language because she still felt in a way that that could happen to them. So there's love, but sometimes it comes out as sort of a perverted love or a distorted love because there's no basis for it. And even in our local community, we saw a, a Native woman who worked her whole life in the health professions trying to help her people to be healthy and well. And she realized that in that she uh, with her own children, she was a little bit cold to them in terms of, um, or she knew that she, when they got to a certain age, she'd shoo them off their lap, that they're too, too old for that. But she told us that she didn't look at her experience at this one of these boarding schools 
until she watched our video. And she went home and had that conversation with her children. And uh, she was really taken back at how cold and distant she felt, uh, they felt she was to them. And they said things like, Mom, we just knew you weren't comfortable saying I love you. And we just knew you weren't comfortable with giving hugs and kisses and affection. And that just took her back because she never even realized that. But now with that knowledge and information with her children and grandchildren, she's able to scoop them up, give them big hugs and kisses and tell them she loves them. So they'll have a different path going forward. But far too often these stories aren't told and that understanding's not there and that the anger and resentment still holds true. And I think with uh, the other part that really gets me when I watch this video is when Elliot Tallchief is talking at the end and his daughter's talking about, I don't know what I would have done if they came and got me at five years old. And he says, I never would have let it happen. I would have fought. And that, that pent up sort of anger and protectionism is within a lot of our families and explains a lot of that resistance sometimes to systems in general, health systems, social service systems, education systems, because they've not always been to our benefit. But the understanding of that's not always known why. And so it's not who we are as Native people in dealing with these issues, it's what we became because of these intergenerational traumas that have been placed upon our people. And in large part, it's why we called the movie Unseen Tears, because nobody saw these kids crying themselves to sleep at night. Nobody knew of the things that they endured. Um, and so those te tears were unseen, except for those that they shared them with in those moments. And at the same time, we know there are many more tears that have to come for us as a community to move forward in a more positive and healthy way to address these issues and to have the healing that we need and to reinvigorate some of those traditional teachings to keep us healthy and well, to get to the health and well-being that we need for our people and our future generations. And um, this trauma of boarding schools and residential schools is just one of many factors that have been placed upon our people historically that have had those intergenerational impacts, unfortunately more negative than positive. And to discuss a little bit more of those uh, multitude of issues, I'm going to turn it back to Pete to share some of those other uh, historical factors on our people. As powerful as the documentary Unseen Tears is, there's a lot in there, as Michael spoke about, and some of the other factors. One of the things that we use in our, some of our trainings is this wheel to recognize the other, some of the other historical and current factors that impact our health and wellness. You can see the debates on humanity, education teaching progress, the idea that I was told in my educational system that the real important history for, Mar for the U.S. started in 1492. Everything, everything before that was not that important, but the real important history started in that year and everything since beyond. So for Native people, we don't get the teachings of our origins, our creation stories, our styles and ways of governance of economic systems and all the things that Michael shared about early in this discussion. We, rec we can go through this circle and talk about all these different factors, but the thing that we re we're recognizing, we've been exposed to these factors f since 1492, so we're talking about centuries of, some would say, being targets of genocide, whether it's actual physical genocide of wiping people out or the cultural genocide that was perpetrated through the residential boarding schools. So as we understand these issues and are beginning to realize how Native families are impacted, we can understand why so many Native communities have these health disparities, whether it's alcohol abuse, elder abuse, child abuse, homelessness, incarceration, because when you steal the soul and spirit out of a person, they look, they look for ways to cope and to get through their days, and they do the best they can. But when we look at the impact of alcohol abuse in Native communities, we see a lot of intergenerational alcoholism, as well as identified in the training, in, or in the video, I should say. We see multiple addictions, a lot of mental health issues. We even see a lot of tolerance, acceptance, and even sometimes promotion of substance abuse, because for many years and in many parts of our community, there's been a norm that if we're going to have a celebration of something good, then there has to be alcohol involved with that. And people use that as a coping mechanism, but we know a lot of tragedies have happened because of that connection of something happening, of something positive or a party, and a celebration. So I've been told by a newspaper reporter who interviewed a lot of Native families, every family, Native family, had a horror story about somebody dying or, or suffering severe consequences of their alcoholism, but every family has that. And because we have so much mortality and early death from all these different issues than the previous slides, 
Dr. Uh, Katrina Walters uh, quoted her, is quoted as saying, a lot of Native families and communities are, seem like we're always in a sense of mourning, where we hear of somebody dying from a car accident, being run over, then somebody else dies from cancer, somebody else dies from suicide, and all these other things. So we never get the time to really grieve and heal from one tragedy, and then we have another one right after that. So as a, so for alcoholism, we, I can understand why some people use alcohol and substances as a self-medicating process to get through the, all those traumas. Dr. Braveheart developed this list of, this is about 25 mental health conditions that, we, that she's identified for communities, community members who are, who are dealing with unresolved historical trauma and grief may be suffering. And a lot of these issues were addressed in the, res, in the, uh, in the Unseen Tears documentary, but we can see the su suicide ideation being taught not to speak your mind. That is definitely something that came from residential boarding schools. The intense fear, as Agnes Williams talked about, when children are always defending themselves, they cannot grow emotionally, but I would also add mentally and spiritually. So we can see a lot of these things happening in a lot of our Native communities, and we can see a lot of the mental health conditions that are listed here by Dr. Braveheart among many of our community members to this day. We can un also understand through looking at the impact of historical trauma, why in so many Native communities and so many Native people, why there's so much mistrust and anger or rage against government and governmental systems, about educational systems, about medical systems, organizational efforts and systems as well, because a lot of those things that have happened in Native history that many people don't know about, such as residential boarding schools, such as sterilization of Native women in a lot of hospitals throughout the country, and a lot of other factors, why there is that mistrust and anger and rage that Michael spoke about earlier, where Ryan said he was taught not to trust white people, not to listen to them, and, but again, never told why. And that we also understand why there's that mistrust and anger of non-natives, but also sometimes among mistrust and anger against other native people. It seems like we don't need the cavalry or other things like that coming to kill us. Many times we're doing it to ourselves and to each other. So taking this lens of looking at historical trauma, we can understand that there are pathways to that, as Michael said, it isn't, it isn't who we are, it might have been what we've, what, we, what we've become, but we also wanted to identify that we definitely need new culturally appropriate approaches to help our communities to get towards that healing. And the one question I'd like to ask, especially with treatment providers and, and folks in substance abuse in the substance abuse field, are we still looking at treatment for individuals or can we expand that discussion to how can we promote healing for communities, families, and then also individuals, and what would that mean? Because so many times we recognize a person goes in for treatment and maybe they achieve their some, some level of sobriety, yet when they go back to the same family systems and neighborhoods where nobody in, the, in that system has gotten any healthier, then oftentimes people relapse. So that's one question we'd like to ask is, are we still looking at treatment or healing for individuals and communities? We referenced before the White Bison Organization who developed that journey for forgiveness in 2009. Two of the concepts that they are talking about that Don Koyas talks about is creating that healing force. So when people do come out of a treatment facility, they can engage with a lot of people in their community who are healthy, who are well, who are along their paths of journeys of their own healing, their own sobriety, and things like that. So people have a lot of connections when they come out to connect to that healing forest. The other concept that Don talks about is the forgiving the unforgivable. And these are things where we talk about if people are traumatized, it's really important that we are able to find ways to help people let go of that trauma, that anger, that fear, that resentment, that self-deprecation, the, the those levels of self-esteem, all the things that we see in, in those mental health conditions that Dr. Braveheart developed. But the whole idea of unforg forgiving the unfor unforgivable is to let that go in a good way so those, uh, we, don't have, we don't have to go forward being traumatized and carrying around all that baggage to move forward in that positive way. At NACS, we've developed an approach, which is our core approach through a lot of our programs and services, healing our people through empowerment or hope. The whole idea is that we, help, we wanna help people learn about the impact of historical trauma and these other factors. Michael referenced the grandmother earlier about how she influenced her life and what she did. And that's the really important part because a lot of Native people may know a parent, or grandparent, or other ancestor might have gone to a boarding school. A lot of Native people don't know about the uh, doctrine of discovery and other things that we're sharing today. 
And that's what we're trying to do, help up people under, learn about those things, but also how we are impacted in many ways in the present day. Doctrine of Discovery traces back to 1452, yet we still see evidence of how that is still being used to this day. But more importantly, rather than just looking at the past and saying well, this is why many ways we're so unhealthy, how can we build opportunities for healing, reconnecting, understanding, integrating our native culture, and building on our community assets and strengths? So it's not looking at the historical underpinnings and historical trauma as an excuse to be domestic violence and alcohol and all the, these other things, but it's a way of understanding our past so we can move forward in a good way. And that's what we're trying to do with our HOPE approach. Our All Our Relations Project, which is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation under the Racial Equity and Racial Healing funding stream, we're really trying to help improve the mutual understanding, respect, cooperation between Native and non-Native groups, organizations, uh, state agencies such as OASIS and everybody else. So we have a lot of trainings that we're able to offer, including today, today's Learning Thursday. We have uh, overviews of cultural competency. We have a training on how do we get out of our silos, because so many times in human services we're so segmented and siloed, people don't know how to do that, but we're also how to get out of those silos. But we're also developing a, a, a workshop. Now that we're understanding a native history and native trauma, we also recognize that many communities have been through historical trauma. So we also want to share what we've learned about our native paths towards healing and share that with other communities who, who suffer the same or similar health historical traumas and also suffer the same health disparities. We're able to do specific trainings for different individuals and groups upon request and we would invite anybody who's interested to contact us and we'll share our contact information at the end of the, the webinar. We also want to improve the health and well-being of our Native American community and our friends through a series of voluntary case management services and a series of cultural events. We feel that a lot of people, Native people in urban environments, we don't access the service, the culture, traditional teachings because many times the ceremonies and longhouses where those things are taught are many miles away. Many of our community members uh, don't have transportation to get out there. But more with the residential boarding schools, we know a lot of people are not comfortable to know how to learn about the traditional teachings. Maybe they feel unwelcomed or maybe there's uh, some people in, in many communities are still so wounded that even though they may uphold traditional teachings, they haven't really embarked too much on their own paths of, of wellness and, and healing and forgiveness. So at the same time, we recognize that we have historical traumas to, reckon, to deal with and to how to overcome. We can also celebrate the tremendous strengths and assets that we have in our, in our community. We have a, a lot of people who are still knowledgeable and willing to share their understanding, their wisdom, their expertise in Native culture. We have our elders and our youth who are, uh, we always say that our elders and our children are very special because they're closer to the Creator. And we give honor to our elders and our youth, pe young people. We have a lot of our social dances, our gatherings. And even though we have, may have high rates of people involved with alcoholism, we also have the highest rates of people in recovery. So there's really some really good strengths that we have. We have a lot more efforts to renew the, our, our health, our traditional teachings, our language and we have a lot of community input that we've learned and listened to at NACS, and this is how we have developed a lot of these approaches that we're talking about, including the HOPE approach. Everything that we've been talking about so far is talking about Native people overall, but we also recognize that within Native populations, we have generations of families who have been in urban areas for a long time. Maybe they've assimilated somewhat into American society or Canadian society, and they don't have that comfort level to know about traditional teachings or willingness to learn. We know we have gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, intersex, pansexual, asexual persons, and two-spirit persons within our community. They are also part of our community. Our traditional teachings tell us that we're not supposed to judge anybody and everybody should be included with our communities and all of our good mind teachings that Michael was sharing earlier. We recognize that people in need of recovery need support. People in, in, in recovery absolutely need to report it need support as well. But I'm talking about the people who are homeless that are out there on the streets and doing things that are harming themselves, they still need that love and re respect that every person deserves because if we give them that love and respect when they're out there, they're gonna remember that when they're ready for help and they're gonna come to us if we give them that respect to say, hey, you respected me when I was out there and because of that, I'm gonna come to you and ask for help. We recognize if we have high rates of alcoholism, than high rates of children of alcoholics. And I really strongly encourage anybody who works with young people, whether they're native or non-native people, because we know 
Native people aren't the only ones who have issues with alcohol. To learn about what is children of alcoholics, what that means, how does that impact people growing up, because it has tremendous impacts on how young people deal with adults, authority figures, and others, as well as their own self-identity and self-esteem. We also recognize that biracial and multiracial people are part of our communities, and we never wanted to give a message that a person should, should only cherish one part of their ancestry, yet not respect their other parts of the ancestry. All of us have the right to be proud of all of, of who comprises us, all of our ancestors, whether we have a single lineage or multi-ancestries in our background, we can all be proud of that. The victims of abuses, we don't know who's been traumatized through their own abuses in their, their lives. So we also want to make sure that we accept and promote and support love and care for all the people who might have been victimized through different abuses, and maybe we don't even know about that. That's when we show why we show unseen tears. We have these precautions because, again, we realize Native people aren't the only ones who've been through these tra traumas. Foster care is another system, and I've heard a lot of people, Native people will have high rates of children and being from foster care. And I've heard people talk about the foster care system is now the new system of residential boarding schools. The idea of state agencies taking away Native children from Native families, and yes, the parents aren't taking care of them as best they could, and they need that support to keep those children alive. But we also have to recognize this another instance of state organizations coming to Native communities and taking away some of the children, even though those are good for, for good purposes. And then the survivors of boarding schools. Uh, we know a lot of our elders may have been, been through residential boarding schools, and we don't know what their paths have been like. We don't know what their histories have been and any traumas. And unfortunately, we see a lot of our elders, essentially, especially ones who have been through residential boarding schools, basically going to their graves without the other, ever having the opportunity of letting go of that pain, of letting go of what's happened to them, of telling other people before in their lives. So they carry around that pain for a lot of their lives and they carry that to their graves. So we recognize that survivors of the boarding schools need that support and love and caring. We're also going to show another six minute video as part of this presentation and before we wrap up with our closing comments, this is a video that we found uh, it's called We Shall Remain. This is another, another powerful video. It's shorter, it's six minutes, but it encapsulates everything we've been talking about in a good way. So at this time, we'll start the We Shall Remain video and we be, we'll be back in just over six minutes. Thank you. One morning I woke up and I heard my brother crying. He was screaming so loud you thought someone was dying. Mom, Dad, he screamed, but there was no use trying. They weren't around. I ran outside and saw he'd had a pretty bad crash. His bike was in the ditch, down his arm a bloody gash. He looked so pitiful just sitting there in the dirt amongst the trash crying. I want mom and dad. I picked him up and started running toward my uncles up the way. It started raining and got real dark. He could barely tell it was day. My brother cried and asked, sister, where's mom? I didn't know what to say when the truth is, I don't know. When my uncle saw us coming, he ran into the yard. He took my brother from me and he held him in his arms. When he saw my face, I could tell, I could tell he was alarmed. And he said, what happened, did you fall too? Uncle, I'm so tired, so tired of wondering why. Why do they drink? Why do they do drugs? Why do they leave us? Why? He said, sister, it's hard to explain. And I said, uncle, try. And then he told this story. Once this land was teepees, as far as you can see. The water was clean, the land pristine, we were where we were meant to be. Then strangers came across the sea and brought with them their disease. Our people cried and prayed and sang, but it brought them to their knees.
Imagine that your family, and most of all your tribe, what if most of everyone you love suddenly got sick and died? And before you even had a chance to bury them and mourn, the strangers came and took away the land where you were born. And you wondered if your parents even cared as they stole you and your brother away, or if they'd been so beaten down they had nothing left to say. And then at school, they cut your hair and beat you if you spoke. The language that Creator gave our people when Earth awoke. Sister, I'm not trying to tell you that your mom and dad are okay, or that they are not responsible for the choices that they've made. But you see this bloody wound on your little brother's arm. If we don't clean it, it won't heal and it'll do all kinds of harm. Those deep wounds of our ancestors still bleed within our hearts. When we remember all they've done, that's where the healing starts. So every morning when you wake, you pray this prayer out loud. Creator, help me live in a way that would make my ancestors proud. We will rise up from the darkness. Don't you forget this. You can be anything you want to be. We will overcome the pain. Just work hard. Never give up. Perseverance is the key. For your spirits live within Strength. Honor, that's all in your family tree, so hold your head up high and know that. Well, again, uh, this is the We Shall Remain video is another powerful, powerful video because, like I said earlier, it encapsulates everything that we're talking about in terms of tr the traditional teachings, the influence of historical trauma, yet also how it impacts a lot of Native families in a negative way. But the thing I really like about this video is that it ends up on a more positive note that we can help young people and other people make healthy decisions if we recognize what's happened in our history what's happened in American history and what's happened in Canadian history that influences so many people, and yet so many of us don't know what's happened. So we're really glad for the, uh, for the people who did the We, uh, we Shall Remain video. Uh, it's a really tremendous video, so I really appreciate the opportunity to show that in today's Learning Thursday. And to wrap, wrap us up today, we just had a few other points that we wanted to make to help support Native people engage in treatment ser services, whether it's prevent or treatment intervention and prevention services or other issues as well. We really, as you can tell, it's really important that we recognize the intergenerational impacts of historical trauma and how people are uh, impacted today and may or may not be comfortable to learn about or to know about their traditional cultures. We recognize the, uh, 
the value of helping Native people to connect and or reconnect or strengthen their cultural conditions connections as they're willing to do so. Like I said a couple of times, some people may not want to know about traditional teachings, yet I believe a lot of Native people inside really yearn to have that healthy connection to what their ancestry is, what their heritage is, and that somehow, some ways we can help people in their journey of, of wellness. I think it's really important that we look at the idea that treatment treatment providers could be more aware and capable of opening up issues of historical trauma, especially residential boarding schools among Native families. So when a Native person comes to a treatment facility who has the safeguards, the credentials, the skills to walk through those traumatic issues in a good and safe way, it would be great if treatment providers could have those opportunities to have those discussions with their people, with Native people who come to them for help. I think it's also important that we look for ways to support the entire community, entire family. The similar as I was talking earlier about are we looking at treatment for individuals or healing for, for families and communities, I've always advocated that treatment and, pre and prevention should work more, more closely together. So as a person goes into treatment, their families also get healthier. They understand how people may change and try to influence and improve their lives going through treatment so that children can recognize why their parents are now setting ground rules, which may, they may never have done before because of their own drinking and drugging, and their own entire families can be healthy so people can connect to the healthy forest. I think treatment would be really good to work with prevention and other intervention services to support entire families. And then to recognize that if people are dealing with issues of alcoholism and addictions, they're probably looking at and dealing with other issues as well that are related. So if we can expand our awareness to get out of our own silos, instead of focusing on entirely on, on exclusively on addictions or alcoholism, to partner with other fields that have similar supports and similar goals to support improved health and wellness for Native community members, families, and indiv individuals. So I would, at this point, I would really like to share my thanks and appreciation for OASIS for offering us the opportunity to share in this Learning Thursday program. I'd really like to thank all of the audience members and you watching this video, this training. We realize these, power, these documentaries are very powerful. And it's important that people understand that our history for American Native people and Canadian people involves these cultural teachings, but also includes these historical traumas that if we understand them, then we can pave ways to health and wellness for our future generations and our people for today. So I really want to thank the people who arranged this. Thank my, uh, my supervisor, Michael, here, and all the support to, to do these trainings. So thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Michael for some final comments. I also, again, express my gratitude and thanks uh, uh, for, for my good colleague here, Pete, <laughs> for all his wisdom and sharing that he's done uh, across our different communities and here today. And of course, thank again Oasis as well for their partnership and seeing this as an important thing to share uh, through across our network of providers and, and those working in the field uh, to hopefully help you be better. And of course, thank you for watching and being part of this and hopefully for your partnership as well because um, it's a case where we encourage you to seek assistance uh, where you can um, uh, contact us if you have clients or want more information uh, because we have a common cause. We all want our clients to be as successful as they can at, at getting through addictions and getting back to a healthier frame of mind and, and uh, living a good and healthy life. And our, our, our common goal is what we have is common cause and uh, we want a better future for all our future generations. So we encourage you to reach out and, and ask for assistance from us or other Native organizations that might be in your area as well. And um, certainly to open your hearts of understanding and offer that assistance. Um, uh, we, when we did Unseen Tears, uh, I told the filmmaker we had two audiences, a native audience uh, at, that, at the end of the movie. I didn't want them to be angry and upset and wanting to flip tables or chairs and, and seek revenge or you know uh, things like that. I wanted them to look inside and internally and reflect on why they are the way they are in their experiences and build understanding and forgiveness of those that uh, might have influenced their lives in a negative way because of the things that they went through and seek a better future. At the same time, we would have a non-native audience 
And I didn't want the non-native audience watching that same video sinking in their seats wondering if the natives in the, in the audience were going to blame them and their ancestors for this. I wanted that audience to also look internally and reflect and open their hearts and eyes and ears and, and offer some understanding and assistance to help us to go through the healing that we must go through as a community and as individuals and as families to move forward in a more healthy way. So we encourage you to uh, be a partner with us and in our communities to find those better pathways to health and well-being and seek that assistance. We're, we're all willing to help because we do have that common cause. And certainly because of the heavy topics that were discussed, uh, as we opened with like a Thanksgiving address and a Gononio to put us in a good frame of mind to begin our good minds as we were sharing this time we had here together today. I also wanted to kind of close with some of those words of Thanksgiving to, uh, as we've dealt with these heavy topics addressed in, in this uh, Learning Thursday, uh, to also put you in a good frame of mind to encourage you to continue the good work that you're doing to make positive outcomes for those that you work with. And so as we put our minds back in a perspective of gratitude and abundance and thankfulness and appreciation. Uh, again, just be a reminder of giving thanks for all those wonderful things that you've had to be thankful for in your day and uh, those perspectives and all those things that we really are, are given a lot that we need to be healthy and well and we can uh, do more and achieve more by working together uh, collaboratively together. And um, I often say, think of five people that uh, we tell our youth to think of five people that they were thankful for in their lives um, that meant something to them, that, uh, that um, taught them or loved and supported them. And we tell those youth to take five people and make them a gift and go and, and, and make it from the heart or whether they create it or find something in nature or if, if they have to buy something. But something, it doesn't have to be a large gift, but something meaningful for why they're presenting it to them. We tell these youth to go present it to those five people and not only give it to them, but tell them why they're giving it to them. And if you can imagine the goodness that creates in terms of presenting a gift to somebody and expressing gratitude for them, and um, it makes them feel good, it makes you feel good, uh, and I encourage you to think of those individuals because far too often we don't take time out of our day to acknowledge and recognize those that um, we are certainly thankful for in our lives that have made a difference. And so I encourage you to think of, in your own mind, those five people in your own lives that have impacted upon you and, and offered them some thanksgiving and let that fill you up with goodness and uh, fills them up with goodness and hopefully give you strength and encouragement to continue the very valuable important work that you do each and every day. It's needed and collectively together we'll be stronger together than we are apart. We put our good minds together to make a better future for our generations ahead. So again, thank you for participating, thank you for listening and uh, uh, Thank you for spending this time with us and honoring us with your attention. Now we go on. As Michael and Pete talked about, if you have any questions, if you're looking for additional resources, please feel free to contact them at their email addresses noted here. Before we talk about the evaluation, I want to continue along the lines of Michael and Pete and then I want to um, express some thanks as well. First and foremost, to our presenters today, in part because they came to Albany from Buffalo to do this taping. So a lot of time on their part, and I appreciate the travel. More importantly, however, they came today with a topic that is very sensitive very emotionally charged and, and brought you a presentation which is more learning on the affect of the emotional realm than the cognitive realm. And in that, they took information that is, as I said, emotional, that is powerful, that is sensitive, and they were able to present it from a very knowledged, professional, and sensitive lens. So again, for, for, being, for providing all the sensitivity around a sensitive area, I really appreciate that. I appreciate it, and I appreciate it, hopefully, on behalf of you as a participant as well. I always have to thank staff and media services, especially after this presentation. I really got a good look into what goes on behind the scenes 
and they put a lot of effort into making sure that the product they supply you is of a high professional standard. So folks here, again, thank you. And I always have to thank Paul Deming. He is the person at Oasis who takes all the PowerPoints we get, spends time finalizing them, formatting them, branding them, and making sure that they are good to go. So all those thanks, and to those of you who viewed this today, and have been viewing us for the past year, two years, three years. Thank you for your support of Learning Thursdays. We really want to continue to do this. And in part, the evaluation helps us to do that because we view it from the lens of how was it? Did you appreciate it? Was the knowledge sufficient? And so forth. And also from the lens of it as a needs assessment. It helps us determine if indeed we are meeting the educational and developmental needs of the field. And if there are areas that you would like us to consider, please make us aware of that as well. So my thinking is this is the last presentation for 2017. So I would just like to take time and wish you all happy and healthy holidays. And we will be back in 2018. Thank you. Enjoy your day.